thanks. It's, it's a great pleasure to speak here. It's, uh, it's a very nice conference and put up together in a very short time. I'm really impressed. And thanks to all the organizers for their work. Um, half an hour is not too much, so I chose a fairly simple topic to speak about, which is also, I think, understandable for most people. Namely, it's about standard boundary value problems with the slight degeneracy. So, um, ah, let's see. The situation is the following. We work on an n-dimensional manifold. It need not be compact, but it should be of bounded uh, geometry. And um, on this manifold, we consider a strongly elliptic second order operator of general form. So if, if you want to write it out, then it has this form here. A is the name of the operator and it has second order terms with the um, asymmetric matrix AJK. The main coefficients are supposed to be Helder continuous of order tau for some positive tau, it need not be particularly large. Then, oh, sorry, we have lower order terms uh, of first order and a, a function of zero order. So these coefficients only need to be L infinity. We assume that the operator is strongly elliptic and that just means that the quadratic form which is generated by the AJK is positive definite. So it's bound away from zero by theta psi squared and it's also bounded above by um, at capital theta zero psi squared. So roughly this is a standard type of operator. The only thing that's a bit unusual so far is that we look at this on a manifold of bounded geometry. Here, just repeat the operator, so just have it in mind, but there's nothing special here. What's special is the boundary condition. And the boundary condition at first glance seems like a Robin type boundary condition. So we call T the boundary operator. And T is the sum of two terms. We have gamma zero, the evaluation of the function at the boundary, and gamma one, the evaluation of the outward normal derivative of the function at the boundary, so the standard notation. And we take a combination of those two with two functions, mu zero and mu one, and both are supposed to be non-negative, and the sum is assumed to be strictly positive everywhere. So what makes this thing a little bit special is that the character of this boundary condition can change sort of from directly to Neumann and back or something in between. And the boundary value problem we are interested in is of course the boundary value problem associated with this operator A, so AU equals to F and TU equals to phi for given functions F on the manifold X and phi on the boundary of X. And sorry, there's a little b missing. These functions should be bounded and this should be actually strictly bounded away from zero on the closed manifold. Okay, um, as I said before, this kind of interpolates between standard problems. So if mu zero is one, and mu one is zero, then we just have the standard boundary condition gamma zero, and we have the Dirichlet problem for this operator A. If conversely, mu zero is zero, and mu one is one, then all that remains is gamma one, and we have the Neumann problem. If mu one is every positive, then we have a Robert type problem. And the interesting case, and that's the case we, we want to look at, is when actually, mu is not everywhere zero or not everywhere strictly positive. So because in this case, so mu is zero somewhere and non-zero in another place, the order of the boundary condition changes from a first order boundary condition if, if we have gamma one uh, to a zero order boundary condition if we only have this gamma zero. The sum is always positive, so one of the two has to be positive. I got interested in this problem uh, through the work of Kasuaki Taira, who has studied all kinds of problems related to this equation, 
intensively in his papers and his books. And um, in his work, he was always forced to make the assumption that um, the coefficients of the operator A are smooth. He used this to work with stochastic diffusion processes. Um, what makes this problem interesting also is it, it's kind of a, a simpler version to the oblique derivative problem. We want to actually attack the oblique derivative problem too, um, which goes back to Poincaré and has been studied extensively by everybody with great name in, um, in microlocal analysis, say, Yegorov, Kontratiev, Ramanda, uh, Melin and Sjöstrand, uh, Pania, uh, and there are probably tons more Hartsmith. Um, but this is, this, oh, sorry, this so far is the simpler version. Actually, I came to this from um, a quasi-linear PDE, modeling a, a Stefan problem in, in a homogeneous background that I still want to solve, but still is not ready. Okay, let's go to what is known. What um, Tyra showed is the following. So what you study is the realization of this operator. You're probably used to this if you know boundary problems. The realization you call the operator where you specify the domain, but the operator acts as usual. So in this case, it's a second order operator as the domain we take the space H to P, so the LP Sobolev space of second order on our manifold X. And we only consider those function where the boundary condition is zero. So this is the domain of this operator and the operator acts like A on this domain. Then we want to look at the resolvent of this operator. So for this, we look at sectors and um, the sector lambda theta consists of all complex numbers whose argument in absolute value is larger than theta. So this is the light blue shaded area here. So you have an angle theta about the positive real axis and lambda theta is this thing here. What, what, what was known and so result by Tyra going back to 1995, which says if the coefficients and the mu zero and the u one are smooth, then A sub t generates an analytic semi-group on the sector lambda theta for each positive theta. So, oops, yeah. Okay, you can take this angle as small as you want, as long as it's positive. So what are we going to show? As I said, we look at this operator and this sector. Um, the, the first result that you always need to show is you have to look at the resolvent and have to show that the resolvent decays as good as possible. And this means it decays like lambda inverse. And that's the first statement here. So if you look at this operator as an operator in P, then the resolvent decays like lambda inverse, at least if lambda is large and lambda is in the sector. That lambda is large is due to the fact that if we look at the operator in a general form, then it can have some spectrum. And um, so you eventually will have to shift the operator a little bit to have the spectrum outside the sector. But that's from an analytic point, uh, not an interesting topic and easy to, to do. Okay, what we show next is that this operator has a bounded H infinity calculus. So, and actually for every angle theta positive, you can shift the operator and the C should not depend on the angle, but that's another story. Um, such that this operator shifted by C has a bounded H infinity calculus on the sector. I'll explain in a second what an H infinity calculus is. And as a simple application, okay, the, the idea is, I'm not sure how familiar you are, um, in, in the theory of parabolic nonlinear problems, the existence of an analytic semigroup will allow you to solve um, semilinear parabolic problems. That's 
been known since the 60s or, or probably earlier. But um, the existence of, a, of an analytic semigroup is not sufficient to treat quasi-linear problems, such as the Porous medium equation. And for this, you need stronger methods. And one of the methods that have been, has been established over the past, say, 20 years or so is maximal regularity. And maximal regularity, on the other hand, is implied by a variety of other properties like R sectoriality, bounded imaginary powers, or the strongest of all those, the existence of a bounded H infinity calculus. So um, we actually improve Tyre's result in two directions. For one thing, we go from smooth coefficients to other continuous coefficients. And we not only show the existence of an analytic semigroup, we also show the existence of a bounded H infinity calculus. So what is bounded H infinity calculus? It's, uh, it's something you probably all know, but didn't think about. Um, it was introduced by Macintosh in 1986. And the idea is the following. You have an operator such that the resolvent decays well in a sector. So I, I stated here that it's an LPX because that's the situation we're in, but it could be any Banach space. So the resolvent decays. And now you take a bounded holomorphic function on the complement of your sector. Basically, the idea is the, the sector is part of the resolvent and the complement then contains the spectrum. So you want a holomorphic function in the spectrum, like in standard um, holomorphic calculus. And you define the function of the operator f of b by this Stanford integral. So you integrate around the sector, around the, the boundary of the sector, um, the resolvent, like a Cauchy or Dunford integral, and obtain this function f. If, uh, if you're a very careful listener, then you will probably ask, well, is this really OK? because we know the resolvent decays like lambda inverse and the function is only bounded. Um, does this actually make sense? At first glance, it doesn't make sense, right? Because the integral will diverge in, uh, the way it looks. But what you have to do is you first choose a holomorphic function on the sector, the complement of the sector, which decays additionally a little bit at infinity and possibly as you go to zero, so that the integral does make sense. And then you approximate and you get this result here. So of course, so this you can always define, but then the question is, can you estimate the norm? And um, what you probably did in functional calculus for bounded operators on the Hilbert space is this estimate that the norm of the function of the operator is basically given by the soup of the function over the, uh, the spectrum, right? That's the standard theorem you learn in, in function analysis one. So here you ask a similar property. You ask that the norm of the function is bounded by at least a constant time, the L infinity norm of this holomorphic function on the sector. You know, we know the spectrum lies in the sector, so this is a good estimate. And um, OK, if this is fulfilled, then we say it has a bounded H infinity calculus. So why is this interesting from a point of nonlinear PDE? There is, there is first a theorem by Doran Benny, who showed this for the slightly weaker version even of bounded imaginary powers. So if you have bounded imaginary powers and your angle is small enough, um, namely less than pi over two, then the existence of a bounded H infinity calculus implies that the operator has maximum regularity. Um, and if you have maximum regularity, then there is a very nice theorem by Clément Lee that allows you to solve quasi-linear problems of this form with very simple uh, conditions and so sort of beautiful setting. Um, well, that's probably all I should say about this. 
So we want to show that our operator has a bounded edge infinity calculus. What, what we do is we start with the simplest possible situation, namely when our space is the upper half plane, Rn plus, and the coefficients are smooth and bounded in all derivatives. And then we, what we do is we, um, we look at the spectral parameter as an additional co-variable. Very often this is called Ackman strict. So we, um, we convert lambda to a square to mu squared, and then we have a complex phase here, e to the i phi. And so, so this is just the, a, square, a square root of lambda. So here mu is positive and the phase phi, the argument of phi is, is larger than beta over two. And the idea of course is, okay, we want, to, we want to do this functional calculus. The functional calculus involves the resolvent. We have to understand the resolvent. And uh, so the idea is to construct a parent-dependent um, parametrics to the resolvent and with lambda replaced by this term here, it's e to the i phi minus mu squared. Okay. Um, then with this, we get the H infinity estimates in the smooth case. Okay, I said before, um, we, we use, we, we consider this mu as an additional co-variable. You can also see it this way. You can introduce a, an additional a differentiation direction in the virtual direction um, in R. And then you get an operator which depends additionally on this artificial variable Z and lives on the manifold X times R. So you, you convert the spectral parameter into an additional um, dimension. And so instead of working with the, with the resolvent, you work with another operator. But this has been for a long time and everybody knows this. The interesting point comes now. So we reduce this problem to the boundary. So from Rn plus, you go to the, to the real line and that's uh, uh, to, the, to Rn. And this involves naturally this operator here, namely, um, we call this function mu one is the coefficient of gamma one and the function mu zero is the coefficient of gamma zero. And um, we now come to this operator S, mu one pi plus mu zero, where pi is directly Neumann operator. So this operator, you know, when you, you know, we had this condition that mu one is positive in some places and zero in other places. So this is a first order operator. So S is a first order operator in some places and a zero order operator in, in other places. So certainly it's not elliptic, but it turns out it's hyperelliptic and it does have a parametrics. And the parametrics lives in this a bit awkward simple class, namely S011 half. So we want to work with this and we want to solve a boundary value problem. So we use Boutet Mobile's calculus, but with symbols of this type. So we have to extend the calculus slightly from the classical definition to, to symbols of this type. And what we then have is the result for smooth coefficients, so for CB infinity coefficients. And in order to get down all the way to top coefficients in C tau and lower coefficients in L infinity, we just apply H infinity perturbation results uh, as shown by various people, say Denk and Hiba and Boyce and others, Aman. Okay, and then we go from Rn plus to manifolds of bounded geometry um, by a patching procedure and I sketch at the very end how, how we apply this to, um, to the porous medium equation using the theorem back limo on the, okay, questions so far? No. Was that a question? Okay, no. continue. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Ah, okay. okay. Um, so, thank you. Wait. 
No. Uh, I have a question. Uh, no, I'm not ready yet. As ah, you have. No, the talk is thirty minutes, right? Yes, uh, you have still ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just I was just intermediate thing. With ah, it. okay. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So we have to show this estimate. So f of a sub t is bounded by a constant times the supernorm of f. We look at the integral, and the idea, as I said before, we replace the resolvent by a parametric dependent parametrics. So the point is only the top term in this parametrics will play a role because the top term in the parametrics is of order lambda inverse and the lower order terms are of lower order. But this integral is just on the verge of converging. So the lower order terms don't cause any trouble. Here this thing converges and you can take out f of lambda and the soup norm without problems. It's only the top term you're interested in. Okay, that's the, the first important point. Um, as I said before, with this replacing, or if you work with symbols anyway, um, solving the Parian dependent problem is equivalent to solving a problem on a larger space. Okay, now comes the, the idea. So we go to this larger space and uh, we call one thing. Uh, the Dirichlet problem is a good problem. And there, the, the Dirichlet problem has a parametrics in the Boutetum of calculus, which you probably have seen um, or know. So the, the Dirichlet problem for this operator here is solved by two terms. Namely, here you have a Poisson operator. So this takes care of the contribution from the boundary. And here you have the Green's function that takes care of the interior function f and gives you a function which, um, which satisfies delta u equal f and u is zero at the boundary. So this consists, consists of the Newton potential associated with this operator. This is basically a, a parametric to A and then this correction term that you have in the, in the Green's function. Okay, so so this is standard thing in Boutet Mars calculus. So what you do is the following. This is, this is our parametrics to the Dirichlet problem. Now, as a first approximation to an inverse to our problem, we try the Dirichlet problem. So we just multiply the two things out. So this is a, a two by one matrix and a one by two matrix. So we get the two by two matrix. And because of the fact that this solves the Dirichlet problem, you get a one here and a zero here, which is already very nice. Um, then you get in the, lower in the lower left part, something that you can ignore. And on the lower right, you get this operator here. And I sketched why this operator comes up. So this, in the lower right, you have the condition of T and K. But t is mu one gamma one, this mu zero gamma zero. And you apply this to k. But k maps into the functions that have precisely the, the given boundary value. So gamma zero k is the identity. And gamma one k is just the Dirichlet Neumann operator because this gives the solution to the Dirichlet problem and you take the normal derivative of it. So this composition here gives just this operator mu one pi plus mu zero. So this is this operator here that I mentioned before. And now you have a triangular matrix and um, it's easy to invert if this operator is invertible. Unfortunately, of course, it's not invertible. It's not even elliptic, but it's hyperelliptic and it has a parametrics and uh, and this exists. Okay, so this is, unfortunately, this is only in S1, one half. So you lose one order. But something nice happened. Um, happens. If you assume you have this thing, then you can write down a parametrics to this operator just by inverting this lower triangular matrix. Um, this looks at first glance a little bit difficult, but, but you know how to invert the lower triangular matrix and uh, and you can work it out. The point is, 
you get the standard terms. So this is just the terms you have from the Dirichlet problem. And then you get an additional terms from our condition. That's the one in red. And so this is the one we have to understand. If we, if we understand this term, we see how the parametrics looks like. And we want to show this is an operator in this extended which had mobile type calculus. Okay, the problem is this is not in the standard calculus. So we have to take this um, to go to this extension. And that's what I mentioned before. And the idea, if you're familiar with the Butet mobile calculus, is, is not so difficult. Um, in, in, a, in a more modern understanding of Butet mobile's calculus, you view these operators as pseudo differential operators in the tangential directions that act on Schwartz spaces in the normal direction. For example, potential operators or Poisson operators are pseudo differential operators with acting from C to SR, and singular green operators are, at least if they have type or class zero, pseudo differential operators acting tangentially like pseudo differential operator in the normal direction, like smoothing operators from S prime to S. And so here in this case, where we usually have the standard simple classes, we just take the harmonic simple classes associated with S1 delta. And you have to make sure the calculus works. So this is the technical part where you have to put in some work. But the idea, as you see, is very basic. And now, um, now this is the operator we have to consider and it helps write it out a little bit. So T consists of this gamma zero part and the gamma one part. And the gamma zero part is zero because th this thing here, this operator here solves the Dirichlet problem. So it has zero boundary value. So if you apply gamma zero to this thing, it's zero. So all that remains is the gamma one part. And so we have this operator here, we have the K from above, the S mu sharp, so the, the parametrics to S phi as before. And now we have the mu one gamma one, that's all that remains from T and this part here. And now the thing is, this is in the standard calculus. This is a very nice operator. Gamma one is a very nice operator. So this fits together. Um, K phi, so the Poisson operator for the Dirichlet problem is also very nice. The only thing that's not so nice is this here, this S sharp. And this is multiplied by mu one. Now you look at this thing and you find out, okay, even though this S minus sharp, this parametrics to S is not good. If you multiply it again by mu one, then it is much better. So before it had order zero, you multiply it by this function, it has order minus one. Still, it's in this bad symbol class, but at least we have recovered the order. And then we use our extended calculus and show that after all, this is a nice operator. In this extended calculus, it's actually a green operator of order minus two, just as you would expect it. And with the concrete formula for the symbols that you have, I mean, you understand the directly problem fairly well, um, and you understand this formula well, and you only need the top term, you can actually work out what the top term of the integral is and estimate it, and that's it. Okay, just to indicate what we do for the low order terms, we use perturbation results that are fairly well known in this, in this business. Um, the perturbation result says you can perturb by the same order if the operator acts on a slightly shifted scale and is small compared to the operator you perturb with. So if A has a bounded H infinity calculus, then you can add a B of the same order if it's small compared to A and has the shift, sorry. On the other hand, you can always add a lower order perturbation as big as it may be, as long as it has lower order compared to A. So you yeah, might have to shift the operator a bit, but that's not a big deal. So, so this is what we apply. 
Um, in order to apply this theorem, we use this freezing of coefficient uh, technique, which is technically a bit ugly and lengthy, but, um, but doable. And then we work on a lattice in our N, identify this operator on the lattice by operators on sequence spaces, and, uh, and like this, with this, um, with this freezing of coefficients, we find that the result extends to manifolds of bounded geometry, but just patching this thing, with, um, that's the idea of bounded geometry, with, um, with patches that are bounded in, in terms of the derivatives towards each other. Okay, and just the last thing, we can apply this to the porous medium equation. As, as usual, we have to take the, the P's and Q's. Okay, we work, we look for a solution in this space in LQ of the at time interval zero T with H2 coefficients, boundary condition fulfilled, and W1 and time of values in LP. And we have to take P and Q that standard in this business appropriately. So both have to be fairly large. So that n over p plus two over q is less than one. We start with the initial value, and this value has to be strictly positive. Um, we want, of course, in our setting, so, so the problem we want to study is the porous medium equation, like this equation, v dog minus delta vm is zero. So it's a, it's a generalization of the heat equation. Heat equation you'd get if m is one. And our boundary condition, but now the boundary condition is some phi and the initial value is, is V0. Then um, we have to ask, of course, for compatibility that phi is TV0. And then we transform this to this problem. And now we, in our setting, we can solve this. At first glance, it seems as, as you have zeros, too many zeros here. But remember that there's a V0 here that makes a difference, right? Okay. So we applied the theorem of Clément and Lee and obtain the solution. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Okay, so this time it's uh, the M. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, in some sense, you you avoid to to define uh, absolute differential calculus with uh, C2 uh, coefficients like in uh, Gerd group stoke or? Uh, Yes, I avoid working with... Um, Non-smooth symbols, yes. It's it's only I for, I do the the full stuff with smooth symbols, and then I go over it by perturbation arguments. Okay, and then you. That's not always possible, but it's a very simple and elegant way to get to avoid working with uh, non-smooth symbols. Because uh, you have uh, everything is differential uh, in uh, your problem. Uh, all your problem is initially. Uh, a, diff, uh, a, pr a problem for differential operators uh, with, okay. Yes, this makes it a bit easier, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I have a question? Have our questions? Yes. Can I ask? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. A couple of remarks. One is that you, you, you were missing a minus in the beginning of the talk. Oh, a bit. where? Uh, first page. Yeah, the man yeah. here up. Yeah. Yes. And here. <laughs> but that's yeah. a small thing. Agreed. Yes. Second thing is uh, there's Konstantin Pankashkin. I think he's worked on this problem too. Ah. Is that at all? Uh, well, I don't know if he can, if his results compete with yours, but I would just indicate that I ah. have done something. And then finally, I would ask, uh, is the domain, uh, I mean, the set omega <coughs> or x, sorry, is that smooth? Yeah. Yes. Does it take a smooth boundary? Yes. So, and what do you do if the boundary is not smooth? With the what? If the boundary, if the boundary is not smooth. Not ah. smooth. Yeah. I would say at least if it's E1, I can over go, 
can use smooth coordinates. Well, you'll have to tell me that in private so we don't waste people's time, but I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, um, you know, as soon as you have a, a C1 structure, then you also have a C, C infinity structure for manifold with boundary. No, I don't know that. So, yes, you mentioned that. <laughs> it's, yes. Is it written somewhere? In, in here, spoke on topology. Uh huh. Maurice Hirsch, I think it's called topology simply. It's okay. one of these yellow Springer books. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be glad to learn more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Or yes. Remarks? Yes, yes. Um, no, okay. I don't see any questions. Okay, in this case, thank you again.